And today I've got a fantastic guest with me. I've been totally excited to have somebody jump on to talk about crypto, cryptocurrencies. You've heard of the major wave that's been happening, you know, all time highs to Elon Musk tweeting things about dog or doggy coin. And, you know, that's skyrocketing. I like to call it doggy coin. And Kurt Wookert, uh, Wookert is on here. He's been in the game, the crypto game since 2012. So he's not just someone who, you know, dove in over the summer and rode the wave and suddenly they're an expert. He's been around for a while. He's been writing about it. He's an entrepreneur. He's a podcaster about crypto. So totally glad and excited to have you on, Kurt. Thank you so much. And how are you today? I'm doing well, Emmett. Thank you. I, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate the intro. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. As you could tell, you know, due, due to some of the situations, I had to change my studio uh, a little bit, <laughs> but, but doing great, you know, um, after the new year, after the, the, you know, December, you know, all, all the things that happened in the market in December, and then, you know, things are starting to pick back up again. So it's been great. Um, but, you know, you've been in crypto for a while. And one thing that I, I, Whenever I hear about cryptocurrencies and I, I listen to people talk about cryptocurrencies, the first thing that's on my mind, and I've done the research, but uh, on you personally, but like the first thing that's on my mind is like, oh, what does this person know about crypto? Like what makes them stand out? What did they just like buy crypto at one point? They just sat on it for a couple of years and then they rode the wave and suddenly they're an expert. Like what have you done beyond, you know, the, the, the basics of just buying a Bitcoin at the right time? So for me, it, it's funny we, when I started, I mean, we're talking 2012, there was not easy access to wallets and, and stuff like that. You couldn't just go into the Apple store and download something that made things easy to use. So uh, in, in 2012, I had somebody come to me and offer to pay me uh, to print some posters. I owned a printing company at the time and uh, he offered to pay me in Bitcoin, which I figured with some kind of video game currency or something. And it, it was a small job. So I was like, yeah, you know, sure. What the heck, buddy? And uh, <laughs> and boy, did that bring me down the rabbit hole. Uh, so it, it turned into um, I, eight years now of, of, a, of a lifestyle of trying to learn as much as I can about Bitcoin, uh, being involved in the, the big Bitcoin civil wars and watching the creation of Ethereum and all kinds of things. Uh, but I, I have mining experience i have experience in the development space uh, entrepreneurship the finance side I, i've i've been involved in everything um but i think my view my, my view is is going to be different than a lot of people who see it as uh first this sort of asymmetric investment opportunity and and that's what almost everybody who thinks of bitcoin or cryptocurrency generically uh, they see it as an investment opportunity whereas for me, it started as as a form of money, like it just it was a means of exchange. And then for me now, after seeing everything that is uh, everything that's possible with with blockchain technology, uh, to 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 see it do something else, I, I want to see something built on top of it to create an external value in much the way uh, that the internet has. So uh, I, I want to see what else it can do. I'm I'm sort of over the the initial hype of like, hey, I can. I can make money by doing nothing. I, I, I want to really uh, be involved, first of all, but but see it happen. Uh, just just see something really, really fundamentally changed in the world technologically uh, because it was built on uh, uh, on the Bitcoin protocol. That is absolutely amazing. And thank you for sharing all of that, because the first thing that I was curious about is like, you know, are we just going to hear about like the basics? But you brought up so many great things. And I have, I've, I think people in general have heard like, oh, well, Bitcoin's secure. Bitcoin's like a way for, you know, people to exchange money without it like being traced or something like that. But it sounds like there's opportunity beyond just this idea of like, what's just trading money. And I, I, I'm so glad that you're going to bring that up. So I guess the first question is just based on what you were saying, what do you mean by asymmetrical? Like, what, what does that mean? Um, so by asymmetric, I mean, you know, your typical person, you know, they get a, they get a decent job and there's somebody in HR that, that tells you, Hey, you know, you need to set aside a, a little bit for your, your health insurance or, or whatever, you know, whatever benefits are offered through the company you're working for. Uh, and that's becoming increasingly rare. So I don't want to minimize the, uh, the investment opportunity that Bitcoin is as well, but, 
you know, traditionally you'd, you'd put some money in a 401k or, or whatever, and, and maybe you look at it twice a year or quarterly if you're lucky and, and you sort of reallocate your money into stocks and bonds and mutual funds, or, or maybe you're one of the cool kids and you go get a Robinhood account and you, you've made big money trading Etsy stock in 2020 or something like that. But, but Bitcoin is asymmetric in that it is not issued by a company. It's not a stock. It, it, it may or may not be uh, treated as a, as a security or a commodity or, or different things, depending on how it's used and, and what implementation of it you're looking at. So uh, asymmetric, what I mean is it's, it's uncommon. It's, it's not something that, uh, it's certainly not something that your HR department is going to say like, Hey, you know, put, put 2% of your paycheck into Bitcoin via this very simple path we've created for you. So it's, it's very different in that regard. Very nice. And I'm glad that you're able to bring that up because, you know, one of the things that I was curious about is not just like, well, you could trade crypto on Robinhood, you know, and you could, you know, buy it. But what else, you know, just to get an idea, you know, you're talking about like 401ks and HR, and it's not something that they're going to tell you to like put money into. So, you know, beyond just the the typical investment aspect, you know, you mentioned that it is asymmetrical or whatever. What is it about it that makes it like asymmetrical? What other applications does it have beyond just being a financial vehicle to do different things with money? So there you have it. I mean, Bitcoin, first of all, Bitcoin is a global network. So it, it connects you to the entire global economy in, in ways that uh, nothing else truly can. The, the internet was a big revolution. And if you look back at the early internet days, the seventies and, and eighties, people were talking about, Hey, this is going to bring about revolutionary freedom and revolutionary new business opportunities. It was a very ideological thing. It was not nearly as, as sort of cold and technological as it is thought of today. It was, it was, it was built by ideologues, people that really wanted to see a massive change in the world. They were typically libertarian, much like early Bitcoiners were very typically libertarian minded. And they, they would look at the opportunity to say, okay, if we can create access to, to global markets in, in ways that didn't exist before, then we're going to disrupt old business models and we're going to create things that couldn't exist before this technology. Uh, and Bitcoin, in, in my opinion, really is that Internet 2.0 situation. There are people in the world that today do not have access to identity solutions or banking solutions or, or the global economy at all. Uh, Bitcoin was designed to, to give those people a tool. And, you know, we don't know how many, first of all, billions of people would be world-class entrepreneurs if only they had the opportunity to connect to the rest of the world. But they were unfortunate in that they were born in places where that opportunity was was too in, infeasible for them. They're stuck living a, a rural, agrarian, or nomadic lifestyle. And it's frankly unfair. And, and Bitcoin disrupts the, the bigness of the world, that disconnectedness. So as an asymmetric opportunity, it really gets no more asymmetric than that. You're, you're basically saying that, you know, the, the son of a goat herder today could be a global tech entrepreneur by the time, you know, by the time he, he comes to, you know, the middle of his working years, simply because of the existence of this new technology. And, and that's why it's so crucial. It's why I'm such a big advocate for it. That's fantastic. And it sounds like there's there's so much potential of it being applied in other ways. Now, here's another question. Um, you know, I, I understood what you meant, or at least, you know, I, I was able to, to grasp a little bit of what you were saying about how this idea of how other company or other countries, people in other countries don't have access, you know, the, to things we take for granted, like, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you know, all those big banks, Citibank, whatever, and the technology that they have, the financial security that they offer. So you know, on one hand, you know, how does the goat, goat herder access the power of Bitcoin? I mean, don't they need still need Internet and like, you know, some type of security to access it? For the time being, you know, so, some of that stuff really needs to be fleshed out. And, you know, that that's one of the things that's sort of a midterm goal in, in the space. And it's one of the things that I think is being ignored, actually, that that really shouldn't be. Uh, and we have this massive bull cycle that's happening right now, and it, it has first world uh, middle class and, and wealthy people very excited because they're 
their ten thousand uh, dollars a year ago is is worth I don't even know hundred thousand dollars today, depending on what you bought. So uh, it's hard to have that conversation and say, hey, by the way, maybe your profits could be uh, rolled into creating infrastructure in in emerging markets to create these opportunities, but. Uh, in many ways, uh, Bitcoin is actually a really simple technology and, and people really misunderstand. Uh, it's it's complicated in an economic sense. There's sort of some philosophical and economic complication to how it's used and, and what makes it function. But from a tech standpoint, it's actually very simple. Uh, so there are a lot of situations where you can use cell phones, for example, which is very common in the developing world. Uh, while you may not have high speed Internet, almost everybody actually carries around simple smartphones. So. Uh, that that closes the gap on on a large portion of the developing world uh, that would not typically be you know streaming high speed video, but they do have the ability to send SMS texts uh, and and some of the mobile internet. So with that very small, I mean, a Bitcoin transaction is 250 kilobytes of data. So if you can broadcast that much data from your cell phone, uh, you can interact with the Bitcoin network, and and that's a really crucial thing to understand that th there does still need to be some infrastructure developed to make that ubiquitous and simple, but it's not that difficult of a problem to solve if you have the motivation to solve it. Uh, somebody just has to sort of get the cojones together to, to jump into that market. Yeah, and we definitely see things in that area with, um, I don't know if Square is exactly the example of, you know, doing something like that, but I have heard about things like that. And, um, you know, what I can really appreciate about what you're saying is this idea of, you know, the, the vision of, the big picture of like Bitcoin or the cryptocurrency space is all of that while the smaller, I guess the, the other, the basic money stuff is just a thing, but like there's a bigger part of it. So, um, you know, thank you for sharing that example. And in light of, you know, Elon Musk doing a recent tweet and just following that, that doggy coin, I don't even know how I, I call it doggy cause it's D O G E, but I would, I would call it Doge. I, I think typically it's Doge, but <laughs> oh, okay. I, you know, who knows? <laughs> oh yeah, a Doge. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. So like, are, are all cryptocurrencies equal? Like, like not, not finance. Okay, go ahead. It sounds like you got it. <laughs> I, but by no means. Uh, in, in fact, um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the Bitcoin protocol. So uh, if, if you roll everything back and you look at, at the development of blockchain technology, and where it comes from, it, you can you can tie everything back to the Bitcoin white paper as the first successful implementation of of this protocol of this time stamping database technology that everybody calls blockchain today. Uh, but the bits and pieces of it actually go much further back. They're they're very simple things that were uh, pieced together by Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, and it was created and launched with uh, what's called a Turing complete scripting stack. So. These are it's a it's a really complicated way of saying it's a computer. It can it can deploy complex virtual machines and applications built on top of it. Now, people don't realize this because the most popular implementation of the Bitcoin protocol is actually BTC, Bitcoin Core, the the one that just hit forty thousand dollars today. And over the last twelve years, it has had most of that uh, that stuff has been deprecated from from its ability. So BTC can't do those things. But uh, this is why uh, Ethereum was created, for example, uh, to, to reintroduce that technology in 2015. Uh, and it's also why Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV split off from, from BTC as well, is, is they wanted to retain that ability uh, for it to be a high throughput uh, computer network, because data is the most valuable thing in the in the global economy right now. And BTC got rid of all of its ability to, to quickly value data. So I'm a big fan of Bitcoin SV in that uh, it does not have any protocol limits. So there's no block size limit or any of that. There's, there's no limit to how many transactions per second can be pushed to the network. And it has a, a full restoration of all of the, uh, the computing ability at the higher level of the network stack. And so with Bitcoin SV, you can have you know, video games and social networks or, or complicated smart contracts and escrow systems and all of these banking services all built decentralized on chain that anybody can access globally without any trusted third parties anywhere. And on the flip side, we've seen BTC, for example, has really become very heavily siloed into places like Coinbase or, or, or some of these other exchanges who are now offering Visa card services and stuff using BTC. And it's because those those abilities don't exist on chain anymore. So now 
there's a business opportunity uh, for players like Coinbase to say, okay, we'll just sort of be a, a, a new school bank institution and we'll use BTC as our gold standard, but we'll provide all these services, you know, in a proprietary and for-profit format for us. Uh, but really, Bitcoin was designed to eliminate all of those things, and and that's really only been restored uh, on on Bitcoin SV. All of the other players are they're either rate limited arbitrarily, or they're or they're fundamentally um, insufficient to compete. And then the vast majority of cryptocurrencies are actually just plainly scams. A lot of people sort of copy and paste things and say, "Hey, this is you know I can make Kirk coin. It would really only take me about fifteen minutes to launch Kirk coin." And if I can build up enough hype, if I have some, you know, social media cloud or whatever, I can get people to think that something special is going to happen and, and basically print a bunch of money out of nowhere. And, and so that's a, a significant part of the cryptocurrency economy, uh, which is really a shame because it, it kind of casts a bad light on everybody. But uh, so by no means are, are all blockchains or, or, or cryptocurrency assets uh, the same. They're, in fact, they're all quite different from each other. Yeah, and and thank you for that too because you brought up this question of you know the idea that that so and I just want to clarify what you were saying was basically BTC or you know cryptocurrencies in general are built upon blockchain which is the technology and then you know all the places like Coinbase which basically just have the technology that helps to transfer coins right is that Pretty, Somewhat, pretty much. So a, a blockchain is just a, it's a type of databasing technology, which, you know, Visa, Visa, the company is just providing a database and a payment network. It's just a centralized database. So all a blockchain is, is it's a database structure that's distributed. Uh, and every 10 minutes on, on Bitcoin, they just timestamp it and nothing that occurred before can be rewritten. Not, not easily anyways. Uh, but but you know ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time it cannot be rewritten and and that's that's the design feature and so and that gives some unique properties to things, but it's not any more complicated than that. It, it's really the the whole debate about anything regarding Bitcoin is how much data should be written to that ledger, to that database uh, in in a minute or a second or an hour or a day, uh, and that's that's all anybody ever fights about is, is how much data should be written to it. And, and therefore, uh, if you disagree, we're all in these weird tribal camps that hate each other. <laughs> all right. And you definitely I mean, from my from my perspective, I mean, you've moved into like the very technical elements. And I imagine, you know, people that are in that in that field more advanced, like that do the mining and all that um, discuss that data element. But I. You know, just for anybody, you know, may, my, maybe for example, myself, that might be lost in this idea of how do I get Bitcoin off of Coinbase? Because I wouldn't know where to <laughs> pick it up. I mean, I know I could go to the bank and pick up a couple dollars, but, you know, if it if it is not, if it doesn't require Coinbase or a company like that to obtain it, how, how would some, what would be a simple way for someone to it. I'm, I think a really simple way is is the gig economy. I mean, people are, are comfortable with things like Uber, or, you know, DoorDash and, and some of these other things where people are like, hey, you know, I, I can do a, a little job and earn 15 bucks or whatever. And, and those kind of things exist in the Bitcoin economy. So if you want to just have a, a simple job and simple career, there's lots of digital nomad sorts of work to do. There's. Uh, I'm, I'm, Personally, I'm, I'm a journalist and a historian, so you know I get paid in Bitcoin for, for being a, a part of the information economy in that regard. But if if you wanted to, there, there's all kinds of services that can be provided. Uh, you can run nodes that, that help do uh, network intelligence for businesses. And if every time your node does something for the network, it gets pinged a little bit of Bitcoin and, and that kind of thing. So there's lots of little ways like that. However, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to an exchange and also saying like, hey, $100 out of every paycheck goes and buys some Bitcoin. And, and rather than leaving it on the exchange, uh, you can you can download it onto a wallet that you control. Uh, because if you lose internet or if you lose your account or if you know Coinbase or whatever decides that uh, there's something fishy about you as a person or, or you as, you know, whatever, some security risk to them, they can lock your funds and uh, and you don't actually own that coin. So it's really important to have a self-sovereign wallet that you control, you control the keys to, and then you can transact anywhere in the world, regardless of uh, you know Coinbase's opinions. And that's that's one of the beauties of Bitcoin is that it allows you uh, to to hold your own money. It's like having cash in your pocket, 
but nobody can rob you of it. It's it's a very um, it's a very different tool in that regard. Yeah, and what I like liked about that your explanation was this idea of you know here I am. What what I was wondering was like oh well how's it made and like what's like what's it take to like make it? But the, I think the answer to actually accrue it is much simpler than that. Just find someone who has it and you know do a job. So, um, you know, and it's not like I need to know how the bank makes all their every single dollar. They just I just need to know how to go to the bank and get it. So um, I I totally appreciate that answer. That really simplifies, you know, what's happening because I don't need to know how to make money uh, or to actually like create the physical bill. Yeah. You know, get it. Get a Bitcoin job. It's, It's the same way you earn dollars. Like, you know, provide somebody some value, provide, you know, provide somebody something that they value more than their dollars or their bitcoins and they will pay you awesome okay well keep that in mind people like right now you are hearing how you can literally obtain bitcoin for a little bit of your time or services or something that you have to offer so this is powerful and okay so since we're touching on this topic of money right now that you just mentioned you know how to accrue bitcoin how to make money so Although you have moved beyond like that, that asymmetrical or beyond like just looking at Bitcoin as like a financial vehicle of investment. Lots of people are probably wondering still, though, I mean, in order to help Bitcoin grow more, more people would probably need to still need to get in. You know, for someone that's wondering like, oh, was well, $40,000 is it too high right now? Like if I put all my money in, like what are the opportunities to actually make money without just buying at the high? If there is any, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, a complicated question. It really could be anything. I mean, if, if you can negotiate a contract with anybody to do anything for Bitcoin, by all means, do it. Uh, there are certainly things you can join Coinbase and, and use their earn.com uh, tool, which is it basically pays you to click through things and take surveys and that kind of stuff. And you can earn a dollar here or five dollars there. Uh, and that's all well and good. Um, but you're, you're getting the, the, the BTC, which is valued at forty thousand dollars, which is you know, twice as high as it, it's ever been, you know, as of, you know, just just up until a couple of months ago. So, um, you know, could it go more? Could it be $500,000 at the end of the year? Maybe, but that's a, you know, it's a, that's a big risk. It's a complicated uh, aspect of, of Bitcoin right there. But what I really like is, is sort of the smaller level application stuff, the stuff that's actually built natively on, on a blockchain. I'm a, a big fan of a social network called Twitch. Uh, it's, it's like Twitch, but with an E instead of an I. And uh, it's it's an all on chain. Uh, you, you pay to interact. You get paid uh, if somebody likes your content or does a branch, which is their version of a retweet and that kind of thing. And so it, it sort of incentivizes the creation of valuable content. So if you make a nice piece of art, for example, you might be able to make twenty, thirty, forty dollars on something like that over the course of a couple of hours, uh, and then that's yours. You you own that Bitcoin. It's yours forever. In fact, I've seen people. Uh, have twitches that that have made uh, thousands of dollars because they were selling like a fine piece of like oil painted art that they uploaded. Uh, and, and then there's all kinds of other things on, on Ethereum, for example, the NFT economy has gotten really big. That's a non fungible token. So this is sort of think um, you ever heard of crypto kitties on Ethereum a, a few years ago. Uh, it's sort of like a like a individually numbered baseball card, for example, it has value because it is a unique uh, uniquely numbered thing. It's a limited run item and the limit can be one piece. Uh, and people have been making pieces of art that are limited to one piece and they can't be duplicated. And the fact that the serial number is a rare serial number allows it to be traded for an increasing amount of value. Uh, so that's, that's something that's really hot on Ethereum right now. Uh, and then moving to the BSV economy, uh, there's a game called Crypto Fights, which is a uh, turn-based game wherein you can uh, have fights between different characters. And if you beat them, uh, one of the things you can do is you can take their their weapons, their money, their their tools, whatever, once you've won, and you can accumulate uh, these items. And each of those items is, is individually tokenized as well. And each of those things also have their own value. So imagine you have been in a thousand battles and you have this battle ax and this battle axe has won a thousand battles, it begins to get its own provenance and people may desire that axe because that axe has been in famous battles that are recorded on the blockchain. Well, that axe begins to accrue uh, its own unique value, just like you know a piece of sports memorabilia or something would in, in the real world. So 
Uh, these are some of the ways that you can start to use the blockchain to value uh, things other than the, the coin itself. You can start to value things on top of the blockchain that really were not able to be valued easily otherwise. And, and these, these markets are emerging, but I, I see them exploding over the next couple of years. Yeah. And what I'm really hearing in that area, and maybe those are just a few key examples of what you're sharing, but what I'm taking away is that people that are using blockchain technology and trying to apply it in new ways, or maybe a little bit more innovative in their, you know, if they compared to if they were just creating a regular game, which uh, it sounds like, you know, as things start to pick up more, there's just so much more potential there. And you mentioned quite a few things there, which are pretty exciting. Whole, the whole thing about Twitch, which I, I've never heard of, and I spend a lot of time on the internet. Uh, you know, I've heard, I haven't heard of NFT or this, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the battle game, which, yep. you know, C crypto fights, yep. crypto fights. Okay. I'm going to be putting that stuff in a description and because that's, that's amazing. So those are some great ways to just, you know, get started and get, uh, you know, get a job that pays Bitcoin and, you know, play these games and things like that. So even looking at what those possibilities are, you know, what would you say, you know, what prevents like the average person or, you know, I would even say that for, for me, I know, you know, more about technology than the average person, but like, even I feel like I haven't heard all this stuff about crypto. So does it require someone to like dive into crypto? How come we're not hearing about these great things? How come we're not hearing about, you know, Twitch and getting paid for social media? How, what, what's stopping us? You know, I, I don't want to be conspiratorial, but I think a lot of these things are so disruptive to the centralized economy that that at a fundamental level, you know, I'm talking about the ownership of a battle axe as if, you know, who's who's actually threatened by that from a business standpoint, right? But but there are a lot of, of companies. You think about how many billions of dollars go into the development of centralized video games. I mean, some of these things have bigger budgets than Hollywood movies today, I spend years in development. Uh, and and to be disrupted by something that that is owned, uh, you know, I mean, the, the the items that are won in these games could outlive the creators of the games themselves. So in a hundred years, you know, my children, I may be passing down video game items in my will to my children as as part of their inheritance. And, and that's a very disruptive thing. Bitcoin and blockchain technology uh, disrupts. And, you know, people are, are struggling to deal with that because it's not just big finance. It's also big media. It is big data. It's big communication. I mean, it, it literally disrupts everyone from the telecom companies uh, to, to all entertainment distribution and then data integrity. I mean, you got to think right now, some of the most highly valued companies in the world are Twitter and Facebook and, and some of these media companies, but 99% of their revenue comes from, from ads. And what they're doing is they're selling your data to advertisers in a way that you don't control. You, you can probably barely understand even if it was explained to you and they're profiting off of it. And you're just a user of this platform uh, and they're data mining you at all times and making billions of dollars off of us as a collective. So to think that blockchain ownership of your social media identity allows you on a place like Twitch to be able to make, you know, maybe only 30 to 50 cents a day. But for somebody who is a big influencer is the kind of person that would have, you know, a million followers on Twitter, they can be making 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars a day or, or maybe even more based on how much engagement they have. And that's so much more money than they've ever made on a place, place like Twitter. But then they also own the keys to that data and that identity information. So they're able to repurpose that any way they see fit. They can say, hey, here is the collective of everything I have ever interacted on this social media platform, and it has a value. And that value can possibly be reinvested in ways to create derivative assets or, or all kinds of other things in the future. So we're talking about literally taking down trillions of dollars of economic value by giving people the power of their own identity and their own ownership of things that for the entire history of the world have been owned by a very small group of people. And it literally democratizes everything about economic value and, and the valuation of data and personal identity. It's, it's, 
it is an incredibly disruptive thing. And that's why I think you don't hear about it uh, unless somebody knows what's going on in the background is nobody's going to advertise this, uh, certainly not for free, because it puts a lot of very powerful people in a position of uh, losing that power, frankly. Yeah, that that's a very powerful point right there. I mean, why would Twit, uh, uh, you said Twit, Twitch want me to know about Twitch? I mean, I don't use Twitch, either, right. but you know, <laughs> why would they want me to know about it? So mm -hmm. it, it totally makes sense there. And I, there's just something so powerful about this idea of of what you were talking about in terms of value, the data and the value of all of that. And here we are, like, you know, I know Facebook does this thing where you can put like, put who your successor is and, you know, they, but in a sense, Facebook, I think owns your like profile in a way, you know, yeah, for, they do in that way. 100%. So it's it just, it's just so wild. And then it sounds like, you know, to, if you value your time, if you value your attention, if you value your, um, you know, all of that, if you value your data, which is very valuable, all these other companies, then we are these opportunities with these blockchain uh, built by, you know, crypto uh, miners or, or uh, blockchain technology developers. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And in terms of the actual, you know, buying and, you know, selling of products, I mean, there's the, there's the digital stuff. And I guess most of the things that we end up buying are probably relatively, um, well, I'm not going to say most of them are digital, but like, where does it go? You know, what companies would you look for if you were, I know Amazon tried to do crypto for a little while or BTC. I don't know if they still do, but where else would we go and look for if we wanted to, you know, live our life with just crypto? Do we have to transfer it to cash every single time or? I, I think, you know, that's another one of those midterm problems that, that really needs to be solved is people need to, to be able to uh, use it on a, on a daily basis in their real lives. And I think one of the simple ways that we're starting to see emerge is the tokenization of a stable coin. You know, USDC and Tether are, are really common. Unfortunately, they're really only being used for uh, trading on, on places like Binance. So they're still not really bridging their way out into the real economy. But this is why I think it's crucial to have one blockchain that, that kind of handles absolutely everything and, and anything that's derived from it should be built upon that single global chain, much the same way as the internet. You know, you don't want to connect to one version of the internet for gaming and then another version of the internet for doing business. That doesn't really make any sense. That would cause more problems than it solves. Uh, so I'm a big believer in having a single scalable uh, blockchain. As far as I'm aware, the only one that is capable of that is Bitcoin SV, which is why I'm an advocate for it. But on top of that, you could be building tokenized derivative assets of, of fiat currency or, or anything else. Uh, if you wanted to right now, if you want to really live the Bitcoin lifestyle uh, and, and never convert to fiat currency and all of that kind of stuff, there are a few hot spots around the world. Uh, one of them is actually New Hampshire. Uh, so if you're in the Portsmouth area, uh, the couple of towns around Portsmouth, there's a there's a, a project called the Free State Project. Uh, it was a bunch of libertarians have moved over to, over to this area over the last 20 years to establish a, a place that has very limited government and, and a high level of uh, libertarian ideology. And one of the things that has uh, gone with that is the creation of a lot of stores that accept Bitcoin and, and do business locally with each other. So uh, it's very typical to walk into a store in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and, and have the option to pay for everything with Bitcoin. Uh, and then there are also companies that uh, own payment processors. I'm, I'm friends with the owners of AnyPay uh, that have developed a, a point of sale system that most people use in town. And you can go from the hot dog stand to the coffee shop to clothing. And, you know, they're, they're all talking about, oh, I got my suits tailored in Bitcoin. And then the tailor came back and they bought some merchandise from us. They own a store in town too. So, you know, th these kind of things, somebody just has to have the, sort of the the business sense but also the cultural sense to say like hey we're, we're a bitcoin accepting merchant and and by all means uh come pay with bitcoin maybe offer a five percent discount or something like that like really signal that hey my business would desire to have bitcoin more than it would desire to have fiat currency and uh so we're willing to give you a discount if you're willing to pay and so there are some pockets like that there's a few more of them around the world but a lot of people um have really gotten lost in the pure investment thesis of Bitcoin. And, and they sort of lost the ability to think of it as 
a simple peer-to-peer -peer cache or as a, as a development tool for applications and, and stuff like that too. And I think that gets worse when we see prices going through the roof and everybody's getting rich and we're like, oh man, I bought that hot dog six months ago and that hot dog's worth $400 now. And that's, <laughs> you know, makes me uncomfortable, but that's, that's just the nature of things. You know, if, if we want things to have intrinsic value long term, they need to have more velocity than just this demand, uh, you know, for the price to go up. Oh, I didn't even realize that I was unmuted there. So I hope I didn't interfere with your, with the, the sound there, but um, okay. So yeah. And that idea, I've heard, I have heard stories like that where people end up buying like a hot dog and then, you know, or, or like it was some other type of food or something or pizza or something. The pizza, the, the first purchase ever made with Bitcoin was pizza. The guy bought two Papa John's pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoins. Chalk, so <laughs> that's, but, you know, worst trade ever right <laughs> yeah and here's what i wonder because you know to think of someone that's at like the forefront of this technology you know i imagine anybody who like got in early like knew something about it they weren't just like it's just a fad so like is it is is this makes me bring up the question is crypto or bitcoin and like bsv and you know the other uh, coins are they exceeding the expectations of what it originally set out to do or is it like you know still i actually think it's been stunted quite a bit you know people people hear that and you know you don't want to be the guy who spent ten thousand bitcoins on a couple of pizzas so i i get that but the real problem is that you know if we get to like sort of monetary policy and things a, a sound money should accrue value based on this, the sectors that it disrupts. So if I completely disrupt the cell phone industry, uh, I should expect the market cap of the thing that was created to replace the market cap of, of that industry. I shouldn't expect it to do more uh, rapidly. And I, sh I certainly shouldn't expect it to do more before it's done that disrupting either. But Bitcoin has become so heavily speculative that it it is, you know, by de facto, you know, to just today hit a trillion dollars in market cap across the entire uh, blockchain industry. But but who has it actually disrupted at this point? So it's it's created a trillion dollars of speculative value, even though uh, it's it, it really hasn't disrupted much of anything. It's it's disrupted small bits of some sectors, uh, but a lot of it, you know, like I said before, a lot of these things are scam projects. And then a lot of them uh, further are, are simple hobby projects. And, and you know, they don't have a, a scalable roadmap to replace, uh, <laughs> you know, anything, frankly. And, and so I, I think the, the pursuit of, of price and the pursuit of this notion that, hey, if you just buy Bitcoin every week and then do nothing, you just wait and it's going to go up in value. I mean, that, that becomes a Ponzi scheme at that point. And, and that's a really dangerous thing for it to continue to accrue value without also accruing uh, d disruption of other spaces. And, and that's the really dangerous part. And, and it's why we've seen a, a lack of adoption in, in business because these businesses, you know, they, they receive a little bit of Bitcoin and then they look at the price history and then they do the same thing. They're like, well, I don't wanna spend any Bitcoin to deploy an application and hope that people use it. If I just do nothing, I could get richer. And that's that's a, a a difficult thing to balance, and it really takes a, a very shrewd and very motivated entrepreneur to to think bigger picture than that. But ultimately, somebody has to do that work and take that risk. Otherwise, I mean, it, it's going to be like the, you know, the the Beanie Baby craze, and we're all holding on to Beanie Babies that were worth a hundred thousand dollars in nineteen ninety six, and you know, they're worth you're muted. Got a little disconnected. Okay. Uh, I, we got cut off at uh, the beanie babies in 1996. Sound <laughs> like you had some great stuff there. Yeah. So, you know, if your beanie babies were a hundred thousand dollars in 1996, they're worth two or three bucks a piece today. And you know, that that's not what we want. We want Bitcoin to be something that's around for generations. And for that to be the case, it needs to actually be useful to people or else it will just be an exploding speculative bubble like many, many other things were over time. Yeah. And 
I, I never even considered this idea of, you know, because because all I hear is, oh, Bitcoin's going to go hit 100,000. Bitcoin's going to hit 100, like a million or whatever. So I haven't mm. really heard that perspective of this, this speculative idea that has prevented, you know, these big people from jumping in. And that makes me, you know, have and I, before I even jumped on this podcast, I was wondering, you know, what your answer to the idea of like, you know, Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett saying, oh, Bitcoin's silly. And, you know, in a way you kind of answered that because, you know, at this point it does seem very speculative. Um, but, you know, with a lot of potential based on the technology that's built on. So, you know, yep. thanks for answering that question without me even answer or asking it. <laughs> for sure. All right. And with that said, I mean, you know, it's tough to stop the craze with with you know so much momentum right now what would you say is like a solution do we just give it time or is it just you know people feeling comfortable using bitcoin or what would you say is like a thing that we can do more than anything i i often say that that business always wins eventually and i i think we need intrepid aggressive visionary entrepreneurs uh, uh you know you get a guy like henry ford is famous for saying that if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. And you know what? A lot of businesses in the very early 1900s would have focused on, on building really great horseshoes and, and they could have made a lot of money doing that. But Henry Ford decided, you know what? I am going to make cars efficient and I am going to make them affordable and that's how I'm going to make my money. But it took a very long time and it took a lot of investment capital to, to be able to create the not the automobile but the process by which the automobile is manufactured efficiently made it cheap enough for everybody to buy a ford vehicle and and that's why ford is one of the biggest brands in in the world and we need people to do the same thing with bitcoin people keep thinking in the old world mode of hey what can i do with this technology and well the easy thing to do is what was done with uh you know penny stocks in the 90s or, or real estate investment scams or all these things. There, there are very fast ways to make money by being a little bit dishonest in, in the Bitcoin economy uh, and in some ways being extremely dishonest and frankly criminal in the Bitcoin economy. And, and so people do that. But what we need is, is for there to be a new class of, of truly the, the, the great entrepreneurs. You think back to the Andrew Carnegie's and, and, and the Rockefeller's and these people who came together and said, okay, you make steel, I'm going to make railroads and you make steam engines. And we are going to build a new economy that's going to change the face of the world over the next generation. And we're at the cusp of that. And, and some of those entrepreneurs are alive today that, that are going to do this with, with Bitcoin, but we haven't seen the explosion yet. We're at the very early stages of watching these things get set up. But you know, we're talking about the data economy. Data is money. Data is the most valuable commodity in the history of the world. And Bitcoin gives us the ability to value it and revalue it and instantly sell it and trade it and use it in ways that we cannot even imagine today. And so to just say, well, holding my Bitcoin is going to make me rich, like it might, but the people that are going to be just unfathomably rich are the people that are going to create the economy that allows you to transact in your own identity data over the next generation of business. Dude, that was all inspiring. Seriously. Like <laughs> I'm just like, Whoa, this sounds so freaking cool. Okay. And, <laughs> and like one final question to wrap this up. And I, I obviously to be an innovator, you know, the answers only always aren't there. Like with your Henry Ford example. But just looking at what you were saying about these businesses, so like what, what does it mean to create that business? Does it, does it mean like just to create another company and then use Bitcoin as the sole thing? Or is there like something else that maybe not the specific product, but like how do you start to grasp your head around that? How can you start thinking in a, in a Bitcoin friendly business way? I think... I think people need to get more comfortable, first of all, with with profit seeking. I, I think a lot of people are they treat it like it's a dirty word. And we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs, the, the Jack Dorsey's of the world. I mean, the, the guy's a multi-billionaire, but he's very uncomfortable with profit seeking. And the reason for that is because the way he's making money is that he's selling other people's data. 
he's he's taking away people's sovereignty over their own identity on the internet and people want their identity to be on the internet so he's basically enslaving the thing they value most and putting it in his own pocket and people do it voluntarily but but at the same time they're, they're earning nothing from it people have this immense anxiety from from social media and things and so I think people need to, first of all, get comfortable with, with being a profit maker, but you need to be doing it in such a way that is giving back sovereignty to those people and creating these opportunities for people to, to reclaim these things that they've lost over the last 20 years of, of Silicon Valley funded siloed technology solutions and saying, hey, open protocols on a, on a data layer that allows you to own your own identity makes it that all of the global economy can, can reconnect in such a way that allows us to, to all get wealthier together, to create wealth that did not exist before, and, and to ultimately use that single source, that single blockchain network, which I believe should be Bitcoin SV, to, to use it to, to connect everything. So Bitcoin should be the data processor. It should be the engine of, of all of these other things. Virtual machines built upon it should be serving high speed data and there should be GPU related miners that are creating proof of work to tell people, hey, this information is better than that information. And, you know, like rather than having advertisers mine you and, and pick your brain and, you know, try to sell you a pair of pants that, you know, they, they want you to buy, it, it should all be handled at the Bitcoin level so that you're only being advertised things that, that you care to be advertised about. And you retain that, that ownership, but, but really everything, truly everything should connect back to Bitcoin so we can stop giving power to all these people who frankly don't deserve it and give it back to people so they can benefit. Wow. And that is great too. Like just this idea <laughs> of taking, taking your, that taking that control of your identity, because, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about all the things that I put online, you know, the Facebook, every single like retail store that I have an account with, you know, who owns my like that. And, you know, that that's, that's a serious question that I think most yeah. of us don't consider. And, you know, we, we are at a time right now, you know, and this is based on what, what I've taken away from what you said is that we are in this time right now where, you know, we've been trained over the past couple of decades to give our data away and, you know, want that like attention or whatever, but there's a way to take control of it through blockchain, through, um, you know, getting back our identity and using those tools that you mentioned. So, um, wow, so many great ideas. And I can only imagine how informative uh, your podcast is and uh, the, the articles that you write. So what are, what are the best ways to, you know, learn more, learn more about your projects, uh, your, your thoughts, your ideas around crypto and go more in depth? Sure. So uh, there's a few places. Uh, my, my main gig right now, I am the chief Bitcoin historian at a company called CoinGeek. Uh, it's, a, it's a journalism company. Uh, so you can find me at coingeek.com. You can search my name, find my articles. I, I write a few things a week. Uh, we are in the process of establishing a new podcast at CoinGeek as well, uh, but it hasn't launched yet. It is in the works. We, we hope to have it launched this month. Uh, and then I'm partnered at a company called Crypto Traders, uh, and we've been doing that for about three years now. Uh, we actually teach uh, fundamental and technical analysis for tra trading and portfolio management. If you're going to do business in the Bitcoin economy, you need to make sure you, you handle your, your stuff right so you don't get destroyed by volatility. And, and you know, we answer some of these questions you've asked uh, at a much deeper level for people that are, are interested there. So you can find us at uh, CryptoTradersPro.com. Uh, I, I've had a podcast for years with uh, Matthew at, at Crypto Traders. Uh, so if you search my name, if you search uh, Kurt Wooker Jr. in Bitcoin or, or Kurt Wooker Jr. in crypto, you can find me all over the place. Uh, but but CoinGeek.com and CryptoTradersPro.com are the two major places you can find me. And I'm on social media everywhere. So by all means, follow me, send me DMs, whatever. I'm, I'm very happy to talk. Yeah, and I can vouch for that because I can say so many thank yous to jumping on and talking about cryptos in this way because you know based on my experience just looking it up it's like you know you hear the basics but this has gone beyond you know the, the basics and really looking at the big picture of what the potential is and what i think not just the the day the daily traders are doing but you know what the thinkers 
and you know the creators of the crypto and uh, the blockchain world are doing. So thanks so much for sharing that insight, Kurt. And uh, thank you so much for being on here and have a wonderful day, everybody. Check out the information in the description to uh, find more, out more about Kurt and his projects.